Tonight at 10, an attack on a busy Christmas market in Berlin. At least nine are dead and dozens injured. Police say a lorry mounted the pavement at speed and crashed through one of Berlin's best-known markets packed with Christmas shoppers. Members of the public tended to the injured at first as police urged Berliners to stay indoors until the all-clear could be given. As emergency services responded swiftly, officials said they were dealing with a possible terror attack. It is terrible to witness this. I had hoped we would never experience something like this here in Berlin. Police on the ground are doing everything they can. We'll have the latest from Berlin, where police say they've detained one person believed to be the truck driver. There is another major story tonight. An off-duty Turkish policeman moments after he shot and killed the Russian ambassador, urging the world to remember Syria. He'd been seen in the background as Ambassador Karlov addressed a meeting. Moscow said the murder was an act of terrorism. Also today in Syria, a group of orphans is among thousands of people brought out of the ruins of Aleppo. Postal workers on strike over jobs and branch closures. Downing Street says they're showing contempt for the public. And we ask if flat pack homes could be part of the answer to Britain's housing crisis. In the south, hoping their voices will carry to those with the power to act and bring a mother jailed in Iraq home to her Hampshire family. Plus, flood defences that should have lasted the winter are washed away. Good evening. At least nine people have been killed and dozens injured in an attack on a Christmas market in the heart of Berlin. Police say a lorry mounted the pavement at speed, crashing into the crowded market in a central square. And they say the incident is consistent, in their view, with a possible terror attack. Within the past hour, officers said that they'd arrested a suspect believed to be the driver of the truck. Our Berlin correspondent, Jenny Hill, has the latest for us. There are some distressing images in the report. Sirens, panic in the heart of Berlin. This, the immediate aftermath of what police suspect was a deliberate attack. The truck ploughed into one of the city's biggest Christmas markets. Moments before these pictures were taken, people were eating, drinking, shopping. As we were leaving, the large truck came through it went just past me, past my girlfriend. I think it missed me by three metres, missed her by five. It came in through the entrance, hit the sides of the barriers and then carried on past us. The driver of the lorry, which has Polish number plates, fled on foot. Police arrested a man nearby about an hour later. But there was a second man in the truck. He died at the scene. So many questions, but for now, such shock. At least 50 people were injured. It's feared the death toll could yet rise. It is terrible to witness this. I had hoped we would never experience something like this here in Berlin. Police on the ground are doing everything they can. They're working with fire crews and hospitals and are making sure the injured are being taken care of. The situation here is under control. Now the experts have to do their work and hopefully on the basis of that we can determine what happened here tonight. Horror enough that such events should unfold less than a week before Christmas. But there's fear too, because if as police believe this was a deliberate act, it's possible that what may yet also emerge is this, that terrorists have succeeded in striking again in one of Europe's capital cities. Let's go live to the scene in Berlin tonight and uh, Jenny Hill, our correspondent, is there for us. Jenny, what more can you tell us about the way this investigation is proceeding and any latest information from the police there? Well, the police actually have told us that they are trying to keep an open mind um, with their investigations. They say it's possible this was a traffic attack. It's also possible, they say, though, that this was deliberately planned and they can't rule out, of course, at this stage, an act of terrorism. It will come, of course, as no surprise to you that Angela Merkel is holding all sorts of meetings. She's in contact tonight, we're told, with the Interior Ministry, with the mayor of this city. And that's because, really, this may well turn out to be what Berlin, what Germany, 
has long feared that this is a terror attack on Well, I'm sorry that uh, we had a bit of a satellite issue there with uh, the link to Jenny in Berlin. But with me is our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. And Frank, Jenny was underlining there the police want to keep their options open. They're saying, look, it could possibly be some kind of extreme form of traffic accident. But th the signals are pointing in another direction, are they? Yes. I mean, the police have said they think it was a deliberate attack. And if it was a deliberate attack, it's likely to be terrorism. We don't know for certain, but in the next 24 hours, I would expect a statement from the Berlin police, uh, which I think will clarify it, particularly as they've got somebody in custody. So they've got a live suspect that they can question. Let's just look at the kind of historical precedent here. The obvious instant that people are referring to on Twitter and social media is the attack in France, in Nice, on July the 14th, when somebody rammed a truck into a, a similar crowd of people gathering an event, killed 86 people. Way back in 2000, there was a plot to attack the Christmas market in Strasbourg. That was stopped by French and German intelligence. But two years ago, somebody rammed a truck into people in, at Nantes in France, and at least one person was killed in that. Um, and only a few days ago, um, a suspect was arrested in Germany believed to be planning a nail bomb attack. Now, none of this means that necessarily this was a so-called Islamic State linked attack. The fact is, though, that they have called for attacks using trucks on people, civilians, in crowded places at this time of year. So the police are keeping an open mind, but you can, you can tell where they've got their suspicions. Frank, once again, thanks very much. Frank Gardner there for us, our, our security correspondent, with, with his thoughts on what's happened today in Berlin. There is uh, another major story tonight, and that is that the Russian ambassador to Turkey has been shot and killed. Andrei Karlov was addressing a meeting in Ankara when a man shot him several times in the back, shouting, don't forget Aleppo and revenge. The gunman was an off-duty Turkish police officer. The attack follows days of protests in Turkey against Russia's role in Syria. Our correspondent Mark Lowen has the latest, and there are some flashing images in the report. Russia's ambassador to Turkey opening an exhibition in Ankara. Waiting behind him, his assassin. As Andrei Karlov speaks, the gunman opens fire, killing the ambassador. He screams Allahu Akbar, God is greatest, before in Turkish, don't forget about Aleppo, don't forget about Syria. So long as they aren't safe, you won't taste safety either. As the attacker was shot dead by police, the ambassador was rushed to hospital. His wife was led out, clearly shaken. Soon after, Andrei Karlov succumbed to his injuries. The gunman was named by the authorities as a Turkish police officer, Mert Altintas, born in 1994. He'd been working for the riot police for two and a half years. His sister and mother have been detained. 62-year-old Andrei Karlov had 40 years of diplomatic experience, ambassador in Ankara since 2013. He handled difficult relations. Russia and Turkey have been on opposite sides of Syria's war. But a recent rapprochement between the two halted the fighting in Aleppo. President Erdogan said it wouldn't be thrown off course. I describe this attack on Russia's ambassador as an attack on Turkey, an attack on Turkey's state and nation. After the incident, I talked to Mr. Putin. We agreed this is a provocation and there isn't any dispute. President Putin called the attack a ploy to wreck the Syrian peace process. Syria's war has killed hundreds of thousands. It's just had another deadly impact. Hugh, tonight more reports are coming out about the gunman, including some reports that he worked as a bodyguard at some of President Erdogan's rallies. There has, of course, been international denunciation with condemnation by the White House. The Turkish and Russian presidents say that they will open a joint commission and investigation uh, to look at this killing. They both use very similar language tonight. They both use the word provocation, vowing that the murder will not derail the Turkey-Russia relationship, nor will it derail attempts to reach a truce in Syria. But there is a lot of public anger here in Turkey about Russia's actions in Aleppo and Turkey's failure to condemn them with protests outside Russian diplomatic uh, missions in recent days. And what has happened tonight is that anger has spilt over into an act of hatred.
Mark, thanks very much again. Mark Lowen there with the latest for us in Istanbul. And as Mark was underlining, the diplomatic channel between Russia and Turkey is one of the most important in the Syrian conflict. Diplomats agreed a deal last week to evacuate parts of eastern Aleppo, where thousands of civilians and rebel fighters have been trapped. And the evacuation resumed today, with thousands more people brought out. Here's our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, with this report. Noisy demonstrations in Turkey at the weekend condemned Russia's support of the Assad regime. Throughout the war, Turkey has been on the other side, backing the rebels. The protests were organized, but it could be that the man who killed the Russian ambassador acted alone. He seems, though, to have been part of a sense of national and religious humiliation among some Turks after Russia's decisive action. Turkey shot down a Russian warplane it said had violated its airspace not long after Russia's intervention just over a year ago. But since then, Turkey and Russia have tried to avoid clashes. Too much is at stake. Both say the assassination won't change their warmer relationship. These are Russian special forces troops in Syria. The Turkish equivalents are in the country too, mainly preoccupied with the Kurds. But there is an obvious rivalry between two major powers who've intervened on opposite sides in the Syrian war. Andrei Karlov, the late Russian ambassador, accompanied his president on trips in the region. He died in the fallout from Mr Putin's decision to make Russia a power in the Middle East again. Also paying a heavy price are Syrians being bussed out of eastern Aleppo into an uncertain future. More than half Syria's pre-war population has been displaced by the war. The evacuation from eastern Aleppo has been so difficult to arrange because of all the factors that make the war in Syria so hard to solve. It isn't just about doing a deal between those who support the regime and those who don't. Foreign powers who've intervened in Syria have their own rivalries that go above and beyond the war, and they have the biggest say. In New York, the UN Security Council passed a new resolution calling for monitors to watch over what's happening and proper access for humanitarian aid in Aleppo. It may be too little too late, and it's not clear how soon it can be implemented, if at all. Right now, it's an important uh, step that I think a couple days ago people would not have thought the Russian Federation uh, would have allowed to go through the council, but until it's implemented, it's, it's just a piece of paper. The Syrians, closely allied with Russia, are deeply suspicious of Western motives. We oppose the attempts of some member states to draft and submit under a humanitarian cover a crafty and vague terms and loose phrases that tolerate more than one interpretation. The fall of Aleppo does not end this complex, unpredictable war. The fight for Syria creates and exports crises. The assassination in Turkey is the latest, and there is still no coherent international desire to bring peace any closer. And uh, Jeremy is with me. A very important summit planned in Moscow tomorrow, Jeremy, which involves uh, uh, Turkey and Russia and Iran. How could that be affected by what's happened today? Clearly, it'll be overshadowed by it. In fact, one of the things they might have wanted to talk about is growing tension between Turkey and Iran because of their rivalry in Syria and Iraq. I think that's going to have to go on the back burner. Interesting, as Mark Lowen said, that they're using the Russians and the Turks, the same language to describe this, a provocation. But the fact remains, they are on different sides in a bloody war. And while they are talking to each other because they have wider interests, there is a built-in propensity for trouble because of that very fact. And that's what we've been seeing. There's also something to think about in the way that the, the Syrian war works. It is desperately unpredictable because of its complexity. We've seen another example of that in the assassination tonight. And this unpredictability factor, I think, is something you can see really elsewhere in the world as well. You know, the world is a dangerous and unstable place right now. Mm. Syria is exporting a lot of that trouble. And what is really sad and worrying about it, I think, for everybody, whatever your political views about the whole thing are, is that there is no end in sight to any of that trouble. And whatever they say at the UN has not been able to deal with it. Jeremy.
Thanks very much again. Jeremy Bowen there for us, our Middle East editor. Well, also today, three people were injured after a man opened fire on people praying at a mosque in Zurich. It happened uh, earlier this evening. Witnesses say a man aged around 30 then fled the building. Swiss police say a body was found nearby, but it's not yet clear whether there was any link to those shootings. Turn to some of the day's uh, other news because thousands of workers are taking part in a series of strikes in the run-up to Christmas affecting rail and postal services. Talks have also been taking place at the conciliation service ACAS to try to stop cabin crew from BA from walking out over Christmas. Downing Street said that unions were showing contempt for the public. Our business correspondent John Moylan has the latest. Postal workers brought a special delivery for the government today. Outside the Department for Business, mailbags containing 70,000 postcards from the public backing a campaign to fight closures of flagship post offices. Fighting for the future. The dispute has been running for months, but the five days of strikes this week represent a major escalation. We're defending uh, postal services across the UK. The very future of high street post offices is under threat. We know the government and the company are lining up to make further announcements in January to close and franchise more of our high street post offices. Well, this dispute has been going on for months, but the timing of the industrial action this week is designed to put maximum pressure on the post office. This is its busiest week for handling parcels and letters. But there doesn't appear to be much Christmas cheer elsewhere either, with a number of unions now calling Christmas strikes. The holiday getaway could be hit, with Swiss port baggage handlers set to strike this Friday and Saturday. It could affect some regional airports. And thousands of cabin crew at British Airways are also planning industrial action on Christmas Day and Boxing Day in a dispute over pay. BA insists it will run a full service. And the months of misery for Southern Rail passengers continues as 400 conductors today began a 48-hour walkout. So should trade union powers be curbed? There is certainly a growing appetite both in Parliament and amongst the public um, to do something. You know, we fully respect trade unions' rights to strike, but it has to be reasonable and proportionate. And I do feel they've been abusing the power they have as trade unions, and therefore some steps are needed. Save our NHS. 2016 has seen a jump in the number of working days lost to strikes. At around 300,000, it's up around 50% on the previous year. But go back in time, and you'll see that compared to the 70s and 80s, strikes are at historically low levels. We're talking about a tiny number of disputes that we hope can still be resolved. What do you say to members of the public who see all these strikes this week and they think, what on earth are the unions playing up? I feel enormous sympathy for the public and really regret the disruption, as do the unions who feel they have no alternative uh, but to take this last resort. Dozens of city centre post offices were closed today, including this one in Glasgow. But the vast majority remained open. The action is set to continue until Christmas Eve. John Moylan, BBC News. Cluster bombs made in the United Kingdom were used by Saudi forces in Yemen earlier this year, according to the Defence Secretary Sir Michael Fallon. But he told MPs that Saudi officials had assured him they would not use the weapons again. Cluster bombs are banned by an international treaty because of the risk they pose to civilians. And there are calls for Britain to stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia because of the scale of casualties in Yemen, as Fergal Keane explains. It's been going on for nearly two years. With over 7,000 civilian deaths. The bombing of infrastructure and hospitals. Amnesty International claimed British-made cluster bombs sold to the Saudis in the 1980s were used last January. Today, earlier denials were reversed. A Saudi investigation showed the weapons had been used. As a result of that investigation and as a result of our pressure, we have now an undertaking that Saudi Arabia will not use cluster munitions of this kind in the future. The Convention on Cluster Munitions, an international treaty which bans their use, was signed by the UK in 2008. 100 nations have now ratified, but so far Saudi Arabia is not among them. 
Cluster bombs can be devastating for civilians. We met 15-year-old Rueda Sala, who was wounded six months ago. She lost her left leg at the hip. But cluster bombs have been just a small part of the British arms trade to Saudi Arabia. Exports are worth around £3.3 billion to companies like BAE Systems. An estimated 50% of Saudi combat jets are UK supplied. We're extremely disappointed today that the UK government has on the one hand admitted that the Saudis had indeed, despite denying it, used these illegal weapons, but hasn't decided to do anything about it. And what we say is that it's clear evidence that what the UK now needs to do is suspend all further sales of similar types of equipment to Saudi. The US has already limited arms sales because of civilian casualties. Ten people were killed here by a conventional bomb, four of them young children, friends of Asma and her cousin Zamzam. The Saudi military contracts are good for the balance sheets of British companies and for British jobs. And there's also the argument that Saudi Arabia is a valuable strategic ally in this region. But as the war drags on with more and more civilian casualties, the moral pressure on Britain will grow. Fergal Keane, BBC News. Let's have a brief look at some of the day's uh, other news stories now then. Northern Ireland's First Minister Arlene Foster has survived a vote of no confidence in the Stormont Assembly. She's under pressure because of her involvement in a controversial renewable energy scheme which overspent by hundreds of millions of pounds. Sinn Féin has called for Mrs Foster to step down while an investigation takes place. A man aged 101 has been jailed for 13 years for historical sex offences against children. Ralph Clark from Erdington in Birmingham is believed to be the oldest person in British legal history to be convicted of a crime. He'd admitted nine charges and was found guilty of 21 others. The Football Associations of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales have all been fined for displaying poppies during World Cup qualifying games last month. The world governing body FIFA regards the poppy as a political symbol, something which is banned. The FA has said that it will appeal. Now, the shortage of affordable housing is one of the biggest issues facing Britain. And modular housing, where homes are prefabricated and then installed quickly on site, has been touted as one solution. And today, plans were announced to build six factories in England that could produce 22,000 homes a year. Behind the venture is an investment of £2.5 billion from China. This report from our home editor, Mark Easton, does contain some flashing images. It's a house on the back of a lorry, turning heads in Derbyshire today. But in what is hailed as a game-changer for Britain's housing sector, massive new investment in factory-built homes may mean this will soon be as unremarkable as a cement mixer on a building site. Two and a half billion pounds of Chinese investment in six British factories, producing 25,000 modular houses like these every year. That's the deal announced today. In their factory-built offices in Warrington, one of the UK partners in the joint venture says the factory-built homes will cost less than half what it takes to build a traditional brick house. Currently in this country to build property, it's usually about £1,000 a square metre. Once our plants are fully up and running, the cost will come down to about £400 a square metre. So that's a massive quantum shift in our ability to provide affordable homes. But not only will the price then come down, the running cost of these houses, because they're highly energy efficient, will be reduced by 75%. The cost and availability of land is still going to be a factor, but if the consortium can deliver on their promise, something like one new British house in every six or seven won't be built on a building site, but in a factory. In the jargon, today's announcement is said to be sector disruptive, changing the UK housing market forever. The billions in new investment come from the China National Building Material Company based in Beijing. Their factory-made homes are a familiar feature in the Far East and they've seen an opportunity to expand the business to the UK. Six factories are planned across Britain, one in Scotland, another in South Wales and four more dotted around England. There'll be a thousand new jobs as well as a boost for suppliers including Britain's steel industry. 
Well, I think if we're going to get this country building the homes we need, we need both to make maximum use of modern methods of construction, um, gets us around some of the skills constraints that we face, but also homes can be built much more quickly. Move and the house moves with you. In Britain, That's we tend to associate factory-made homes with cheap and drafty post-war prefabs. But 21st century modular homes are very different, designed to be aspirational places to live. These factory-made council homes being launched in South London are similar to the kind of product the new factories will produce. Residents say they love them. Then I invited my friends to come and see. They said, wow, is this a house? I said, office. I said, just come and see. It's very spacious. I didn't expect it. it properly soundproofed. And I'm thinking, I live on the high street and you can hardly hear any noise. Some might question why Britain needs Chinese investors to solve its housing crisis. But if actions match the words, today may go down as the day when British homes no longer meant bricks and mortar. Mark Easton, BBC News, Warrington. Now, last Christmas, David Cameron was seven months into a five-year term as Prime Minister of a Conservative government. Donald Trump was six months into his campaign for the US presidency, still seen as a maverick candidate with very little chance of success. Syria was in turmoil. And then 2016 happened, and Syria, of course, is still in turmoil. But the other political realities have been turned upside down, amid much talk of fake news and post-truth politics. Well, in his first of a series looking at how the world changed in 2016, our special correspondent, Alan Little, has this assessment. How does America get its news? How does it know who or what to trust? Traditionally, the news has come from places like this. The Tribune Democrat of Western Pennsylvania still rolls off the machinery of a pre-digital age. You find conflicting opinions in its pages, a diversity of views. It offers its readers a shared public reality within which they can disagree, dispute and challenge each other. But does that guiding journalistic purpose also now belong to a fading pre-digital age? I think of the mission here as, as to both chronicle the life of a community and also to try to you know, help it move through its challenges. When I grew up and, and went to college, they, they always had us challenging ourselves to look at where the message came from. And I don't know if people want to know that anymore. I think they just want to be, I'm here and, and this is what I think. And, and that, that's interesting to me, but it's also terrifying. Traditional journalism is losing its power to the internet and the echo chamber of social media. There are two Americas now, each listening to its own preferred news sources, two parallel public realities. What do we have here? Well, this is something that appeared frequently on social media. And it's a quote attributed to Donald Trump, and it says, People Magazine, 1998. And the quote is, if I were to run, I'd run as a Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. They believe anything on Fox News. It sounds very authentic, doesn't it? It, it sounds like the real Donald Trump. Yeah, it does. Uh, but he never said this. It's, it's, a, it's a total made-up quote. In your face. Fake news has now infiltrated U.S. politics. The Internet is full of it. We're online. Online, made-up stories look like real ones, and they will confirm what you already believe. We have ignition. Strap in. This is a fake news website. Pope Francis shocks world, endorses Donald Trump for president, release a statement. And this was shared like a million times on social media. The debunking of that fake piece was shared 30,000 times. Are there also now two Britons, each with their own parallel truths? Remember this claim made by the campaign to leave the EU. This is what that bus looks like now. New livery, new colours, the £350 million a week for the NHS is gone, just as it's gone from the national discourse. Is this Britain's version of post-truth politics? We knew exactly who made the claim written on the side of this bus. They were challenged every day on television. There is still a shared public reality in British politics, a common square where news is generated and consumed. But it's gone in America, and it could go here too. The dangers to democracy are obvious.
I think if you want to have a vision of the future, look to Russia, where actually one of the things under Vladimir Putin has been about creating a regime where no one can really know anything and, and keeping people in this kind of fog of uncertainty. Someone trying to create, a, create an atmosphere in which there are no experts, nobody can know anything, so you probably better let you know a strong man kind of take in charge and, and govern. And that's not great for democracy, is it? Terrible, terrible for democracy, and actually, you know, terrible for journalism. But democracies also value freedom of speech, the right to say things others find offensive. Who in the new media landscape is to police what's valid and what's fake, what's true and what's post-truth? 2016 has given the question new urgency. Alan Little, BBC News. And uh, Alan will be back uh, tomorrow night with the second of those special reports on the great momentous changes in the events of uh, 2016. Let's have more on the main story tonight, the attack on that busy Christmas market in Berlin. We're still saying, according to the sources there, at least nine people have died. Dozens of people were injured when it happened. Our correspondent uh, Jenny Hill is at the scene. It's near the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church in central Berlin. Jenny, just br bring us up to date on any further information that uh, police and officials there in the city have been uh, giving you in the past half hour. Yeah, the police, Hugh, are very much keeping an open mind on this one. I think they're saying that it is possible this was a deliberately planned attack. They can't rule out a terror motivation. Equally, they say it may yet have just been proved to have just been a, a traffic accident. Very, very early stages in their investigation. Very few details to be gleaned at this stage. Many, many questions. What we do know, of course, is that earlier this evening, hundreds, thousands of people came to this, one of Berlin's biggest Christmas markets, to enjoy the festivities. Instead, they witnessed scenes of horror. Nine people lost their lives. More than 50 people are injured. Some of them, we're told, are fighting for their lives tonight. It is feared that the death toll here may yet rise. Jenny, thanks very much for, for the, the update. Uh, Jenny Hill in Berlin after that uh, incident um, early this uh, evening. Um, and uh, there'll be more on that, of course, uh, and any developments on the BBC News Channel throughout the night. But now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.